What's up, everybody? OMS back at you. Beautiful day out here in Bedford, Kentucky. It's uh, 77 degrees out here. Out on this asphalt right now. Just beautiful. Blue skies. March 15th, Tuesday today. Up here, uh, Trimble Tobacco. Getting an update, starting off the um, 2016 um, Burley season. Got an invite to come up here and uh, see the process and share the process of them getting started up here at Trimble. Trimble Tobacco, five generations of uh, Burley uh, tobacco farming in this family, so tradition runs deep. Anybody that's uh, watched my videos well knows uh, the Trimble, the Young family, the Young Farms. Good, uh, good folks. Smoking my um, OMS Dublin today. Some Penzance that um, picked up a ten of this with uh, my buddy Donald the other day. Drinking some um, OMS Shanate roasted um, yesterday. It's the OMS house blend right here. It's the OMS house blend right here. That fresh bean. Give it a try. Go on to the website and grab a grab a bag. Guarantee you won't be disappointed. Anyway, enjoy. Till next time, I'll uh, be back at you. Y'all have a good day now and um, stay smoky. Rick Pitino knows it well because he applies the very same stuff. Anyway, oh well, yeah, why would why would that work? Why, why, why would it? Because I haven't put a new regulator in it yet. <laughs> that might be a permanent fix, huh? That might just be one of those inherent features of this truck. I haven't fixed I'll have it. to remember that. I haven't fixed it yet, but I have fixed two or three in the past, so I'm well aware of the procedure. I just haven't got it done. No comment? Okay. It's not quite media savvy just yet. No. He ducked me. He ducked out on me. That's my little buddy, though. He don't know it, but I know it. Man, when I first saw him, he was about the size of your hand. <laughs> Facebook does that time hop. It shows me pictures that I posted oh, one year ago, yeah, two years ago, and five years ago. So what varieties you got going on this year? I've got a couple of old ones and a couple of new ones. Back with Newton's again. Spoke with Mr. Newton at the tobacco meeting in Owensboro. He's 92 years old. Still raising seed tobacco at his farm. Got KT209, which is a black shank resistant variety in the lineup again this year. Then I got a couple of new ones. Uh, KT215 was just released. There's a limited supply, and I got my hands on some of that. Got somebody wants a race. <laughs> Get them! All right, so. <laughs> and then I've got some uh, 404. I've not raised any 404 before. It's been around a few years. And we'll have some of that this time. 
Since we've got them steamed and they're sanitary, we don't want to set them on the floor. So how how important is uh, having these things cleaned and sanitized and everything? And what's that really mean to uh, the operation? If uh, this is a 2014 and it's only been used twice, or it's only been used once. It's only been used one or two times, and as you can see, the cells are really clean. But pick up one of these older trays. You're going to see little fragments of root in the cells. Yeah, it's just breaking down eventually. Huh? Well, the plant grows into the styrofoam. Mm. And if the, if the plant does grow into the styrofoam and we can't get all that back out of there, then whatever disease we may have had in that particular year will still be there. So we get them steamed, and that way any root matter that's left in there is now sterile. And we got these. Also in here, we strip our tobacco in the winter time, so there's dust. And even though we've like disassembled and cleaned this entire area a couple of times, we still don't want to set these trays on the floor if we can help it. So we've got a clean piece of plastic here, and then over there on the skid where I'm stacking the finished product, we've got a clean piece of plastic. Sort of like a surgeon maintaining a sterile field. Uh, we're not quite that particular but we do want to make sure that we don't contaminate the new crop with the old disease because it can go through that greenhouse in about three days and wipe it out it doesn't take long for that um, pythium problem to explode when when it's hot and humid inside the greenhouse so before I push one through the hopper I'm just going to kind of give it a visual inspection to make sure there's no cobwebs or insects or or any other obstructions in the cells and and if the cells are good to go, then push right through the dirt hopper. Now, what about the the soil, the plant and soil that you're using? This about is its a, contaminants and how you. This is a specific uh, mix that's made for tobacco, and it has also been sterilized. They steam this stuff after they make it, kill any weeds that may be in it or whatever. You want to see? Here. No? Ready? Ready to push? And when they come out the other end, we'll take the excess dirt. What we don't want to do is we don't want to press it down with our hands. Uh, the amount of, of compaction that the hopper creates is just about all the compaction that we want. So we'll just scoop the excess off the top. Put it right back in the hopper. All right, now you do your side. Ready? Just scoop that right off the top. Put it in the hopper. And then we'll scoop again until we get them nice and clean. After we get a tray clean, we can take it over here to the dibble. And any extra dirt that falls on the table could go into the recovery hopper, and we'll recycle that back into the dirt hopper since they don't give this stuff away for free. We'll pay about $11 a bag for this dirt.
what I'm doing is I'm lining one bead with one cell and I'm going to press this down and when I press it down all the way there's a little piece of trim on here that's going to touch the tray that's sort of a depth stop so that I don't dibble too deeply after I get that pressed down good and tight I'm just going to release we should be left with one divot per cell and we try to get those centered up and that's the objective is so that the seed will roll to the center of the divot we want that seed to be germinating in the center of that cell so it has its own micro environment it's a little, little climate there and I emptied the cedar last night I never leave seed in the cedar overnight so I'm going to have to add seed back to it and I need three more trays of this particular variety. Uh, this is the, the Newton seed. Hopkinsville, Kentucky. What's that, 100,000? There's 50,000 in this container. And uh, this uh, certification is required for all seed. Uh, corn, soybeans, wheat, tobacco. I think garden seed is the only seed that's exempt from a state inspection. Yeah, buddy. And what can you say about Newton? Uh, we had really good luck with this variety uh, and this seed company for the past two seasons. So uh, here we are back with our third consecutive season. Blue. 50,000 seeds is uh, barely enough to do 180 trays which is what I'm asking it to do. You can do the math, 180 trays times 288 cells, probably more than 50,000. When they, when they uh, package the seed, they package it by weight, so there may actually be a few more than that in there. So now, I'm gonna try to evenly distribute this small amount of seed across the cedar to make sure everybody gets one. Ordinarily, I would have a lot more seed float, floating around in here, and it wouldn't be a problem. Just going to do so, a quick. So these are these are custom made. The uh, cedar is a proprietary design. There's a fellow in Lockport, Kentucky, that makes these at his house, and he filed for and got a U.S. patent on his design. There's uh, three plates in the cedar. And the plate that's in the middle is the one that moves. And the, the plate that's in the middle picks up one seed, and as you move it over to the left, it drops it out the bottom, which corresponds with the cells in the tray. And now you can see that every one of those... We hope. Those pods hopefully will germinate into... Into a plant that we can put in the field. Lovely. Yeah, buddy. Are we going to feed We're seeding right now, bud. I'm going to push another one through. You want to scoop it? You ain't tired yet, young fella? You're not. You ready to go? Daddy. Here it comes. Well, how'd we do last year? Uh, Dad and I each had a contract for 40,000 pounds, and we filled both contracts. Uh, we averaged somewhere in the low 190s on price. That's and uh, Per pound? Per pound. That's good. And we uh, went last week. Our contract was a five-year contract, and there's two years left on it. But we still had to go sign a, a document of some sort to say that we were going to continue. And uh, nobody really knows what's going to happen at the end of that. So I've, I've got a contract good for 16 and 17 crops. After that, all bets are off. We don't know if we'll still be in business, if they'll ask us to grow another contract. They did tell us when we were up there that they're not going to sign any more five-year contracts. It's going to be like one year at a time. So I guess if you grow a good crop and deliver it and they're happy, they'll sign you up for the following year. Or if your crop's not so good and they're not so happy, they may say thanks for playing and you're done. Yeah, buddy. Um, I accidentally dropped the thing to this in there. You dropped the scooper? Yeah, accidentally. Oh, I'll get it. There you go. 
when I'm scooping it in, I'm still not done with other tray. Well, every once in a while, you'll get a technical difficulty and have to... Want me to get this side for you? Yep. How about you get those sides and I get this side? Deal. The first one is the faster one than mine. This is that well, that one's mine. And, um, I think this used to be, um, yeah, it was used to be, um, Daniel's tractor, and this is my tractor that's broken right in the front. Well, thanks, uh, for the tour. That's a pretty good collection of, uh, rides you have. And you want to see how fast this is. Which one's your favorite one? Is this the red one? No, it's this red one. That one? Yeah. You want me to show you how fast it can go? Sure, let's see your maneuvering. Let's see. Not a very good um, walking will make it go really, really, really fast. This is a foliar feeding product. Uh, we'll use this on our tobacco as well as the uh, soybeans. There's um, every year a meeting that we go to and they, they feed us real good and then they tell us about the new up and coming products that they're offering for this season. And uh, we use this product in the transplant water when we plant the tobacco. And we also use this product in the sprayer when we go over the top. And farmers are doing a really good job with the three primary nutrients, which are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. But farmers are losing some yield because of shortages of calcium, boron, manganese, some of the micronutrients. And also because in this area, sometimes the soil binds up the fertilizer that we put on there and makes it unavailable to the plant. So products like this help the plant get whatever nutrients it may need that are that are lacking in our current fertilizer program. So today we went and, and had a really nice meal and they told us about this product along with some others. Uh, obviously this product's been on the market a couple of years and we had some extra left over after last season so we'll be using what we have left over to start with and then uh, we may try some other experimental stuff this season in the in the transplant water. Uh, that's a great opportunity to have a big impact on yield because that root for that plant's only this big. And if you put that in the transplant water, it goes directly on that root. So a very small amount of a product like this can make a huge difference in yield. Does it have any um, shelf life and what's the application process? Is it fuel to the water? Uh, this one here has a shelf life of several years. Some of the products we learned about today have shelf lives of like 18 months or even just one year because they're biologicals. So if we use any of those biologicals, we'll have to be sure we use them all up. But this one here will keep year after year after year. It's, the, it's a carbon-based product that uh, I guess it starts with coal. And I don't really know all the ins and outs of how it's manufactured, but I do know that there's carbon and, and by applying that carbon in the root zone, it helps that plant get off to a good start and helps that plant be better able to take up the nutrients that are already present in the soil. So what's the process in applying it? Do you have to... We'll take maybe a half gallon of this and put it in that big barrel full of water that we set tobacco with. And that one big barrel of water, 300 gallons, does one acre. So a half gallon of this, 300 gallons of water, that's one acre. When we spray it over the top, we may use a quart, we may use a half gallon, and we'll mix it when we're, we're already out there with the sprayer to spray herbicide or fungicide or some other process. So we may add this product to that tank mix. So we're really not making a special trip just for this. You know, we're already out there anyway for another purpose.
Piggy's on break. As long as we don't run into that. Yeah, that, that wouldn't be a good idea. I like that's why it's up high. So I can run into it instead. <laughs> Well, you got options. It's good to have options when you're so young. You got this one, the Hot Wheel. We have three children, and my brother has three children, so there must be a minimum of six toys here at one time. And naturally, they all want the same toy, despite the fact that you have one for everybody. So how many acres are you planning for this year? And how, how many is your dad and is uh is uh Jerry doing any tobacco or is he out? Jerry's out. Uh I'm gonna do twenty and dad's gonna do twenty. What do you got you got soy in the rest or we do and I'm gonna have hay on some and um, several of my fields are planting wheat behind the tobacco and I intend to harvest that wheat this year and not only sell the wheat but then bale up the straw afterwards so I can sell straw bales. I had several calls this year for straw and I didn't have any. Yeah, I'd like to get some uh, myself. If we can arrange so, that. So my son can do some bow hunting and stuff or bow Yeah, they make practice. back stops for your targets. We always have a few customers who have dogs, so they want bedding for their dogs. Uh, some of our clients called because they wanted to do some fodder decorations around their house. You know, a couple straw bales and a, and a fodder shock of corn and some pumpkins makes a neat little fall decoration. But we didn't have any, and uh, I'm going to rotate out of those tobacco fields for at least one season, maybe a couple, to, to let that soil rest, so to speak. And um, so I'm going to let that wheat go full term, and then we'll harvest it in July. Probably right around the 4th of July, we'll be harvesting wheat. So, uh, I, heard, I heard you took a, a nice uh, coyote. I had um, some cows that were calving near the house, and uh, the dogs were raising cane, and I just come off the night shift, and I looked out the window and saw two coyotes down there, and they were within 100 yards of the cows with the new calves. And uh, I came to the conclusion that these coyotes were there to have calf. And so I dispatched one of them with my rifle and the other got away before I got a second shot off. And I don't, and I don't know, we may actually do some, some calling and uh, try to call in some coyotes and thin them down. I can hear them at night outside my house when I'm laying in bed. You'll, you'll hear them start howling and yipping and carrying on. So there's apparently quite a large population of them. And, and uh, left unchecked, I think they could probably be an a economic threat to our cattle herd. So uh, I think we're probably going to thin them out a little bit. All right. <clears throat> Bob Miller has been breeding tobacco at the University of Kentucky since 1980. And his first commercial release occurred six years later as Tennessee 86. I'm sorry, he was at the University of Tennessee at that time. And uh, Bob's breeding program produced Tennessee 86, Tennessee 90, Tennessee 97. Well, in the year 2000, uh, amid funding concerns, the University of Kentucky partnered with the University of Tennessee. And in that year, the KT varieties, which stands for Kentucky and Tennessee, started coming out. And the first release in the KT series was KT200 in the year 2000. Subsequent releases were KT204, KT206, and KT209 in 04, 06, and 09, respectively. 2010, we saw KT210 come on the market. And then this year, KT215 is on the market. And each subsequent variety has resistance to a specific set of diseases so that if a farmer knows 
that his fields are infested with a certain disease, he can pick a variety that's resistant to those diseases, which is going to reduce the amount of chemicals he has to buy and spray on that tobacco to combat those disease problems. So in my lineup, you're going to see several different varieties, and all of that's based on what's wrong with that particular piece of ground. Word on the street is demand for U.S. Burley is soft. They're, the companies are offering no new contracts. People who have a contract are seeing their poundage is reduced or eliminated completely. The uh, price that they're offering for next year's crop is about a nickel less than it was this year. And uh, we're looking at some lean times ahead because we've already slashed about as many costs as we can. So our cost of production is about as low as we can possibly get it, whereas the money that they're going to pay us has gone down a nickel. So, you know, we're, we're going to try to skimp everywhere we can this, this season to make up for that nickel that they took away from us. And then at the end of, not 16, but 17, we're not real sure what's going to happen. That's when our contract runs out, our multi-year contract, so we don't know if if they'll be offering contracts in the future. I don't think they know yet. The other problem we've got right now is tobacco, particularly U.S. Burley tobacco, is a globally traded commodity, and the value of the dollar relative to other currencies is increasing. So that makes our tobacco less competitive on a global scale, even though the price that we're getting has gone down. So the exchange rate between the dollar and other currencies is really out of our control, but we're going to pay for it anyhow. In response to decreased demand for our burley, we're going to move into direct marketing of beef. As such, we've got 12 steers on feed in the barn right now. We've got an appointment for two of them at a newly opened butcher shop over in Camelsburg. And the way that works, there's a, there's a family from our church who's interested in a half of beef, a, si a side of beef. So we're going to take the steer over there to the, to the butcher and we're going to fill out a piece of paper, tell them how thick we want our steaks, how many pounds we want in our packages, a hamburger, so on and so forth. And then when they process that beef, my wife and I will get half of it, and that other couple will get half of it. Another method, if customers want to come here to the farm and buy individual packages, we have to have it USDA inspected, and that facility is going to have a USDA inspector on site starting next week. So we're going to take them a, a steer, and they're going to process it, and we'll have a freezer right here in the blue bar, and you can come over and buy steak and burger. And it comes right here off this farm. These animals have never had a needle stuck in them. They've eat hay, they've walked around out here and eat grass, sunshine just the way God made them. Organic gra grass fed. Yeah, we can't get organic certification because we use chemicals on the tobacco which is adjacent. But it's not like we're turning the cows loose in the tobacco patch. I mean those cows are grazing over there and our tobacco production is over here. But we would have to go completely organic with our tobacco for three years to meet certification. So we can't technically call it organic. We can call it pasture raised or farm fresh or a dozen other hot button terms, but suffice it to say that those animals have eaten grass and hay and corn right here from this farm and then been processed at the next county over and that's what the customer will be getting. So how old are the steers? What the, what's the, the, the harvest uh, they'll be weight? Five, they'll be five or six hundred pounds. And the yield? Uh, Fifty, fifty percent give or take. Fifty five. So you got a couple hundred pounds of beef. We'll we'll know more after we do the first couple. Six hundred pounder. If it yielded three hundred pounds of product, you'd have three hundred pounds of product to sell. And finish, we don't know what percentage of that'll be steak and what percentage will be burger. And the customer may just want all burger, or they may want 
steak and roasting burger. I mean, that, that combination is up to the customer what, what they want if they buy the side of beef. Now, if, if they just come down here and buy packages retail, then uh, that burger will be probably everything but the steak. Ribeye probably the only thing cut out of Whoop. it. Whoop. Overshot it. We can see that. Now, what's their um, mostly I mess, their method of? Um, I don't honestly know. <clears throat> uh, I do know that the uh, facility that's going to be doing the processing is brand new. All of their equipment is the latest. Uh, most modern equipment available can be paper wrap or vacuum pack wrap. Uh, they, they do vacuum packaging for an additional fee. Um, Will they, um, any, any word on if they're, they'll offer uh, dry aged beef? They had some, they had some uh, pieces in the cooler that they told us had been there for a couple weeks. They're experimenting with that to see how that works out. And uh, when we pulled up today to get those sheets for our customers to have their animals cut, they, uh, I smelled hickory smoke. And uh, they also do hogs and goats, and they were smoking some hams. <clears throat> so, and where is this uh, facility? It's, it's in Campbellsburg. It's Campbellsburg, between here and Kentucky. between here and your house. Trackside butcher shop. Like if you go to Bedford and hang a left, instead of getting on 71, just go straight. Maybe another mile and a half. Two miles. You're going to intersect 421. And if you'll make a left and a right, you'll be there. Or you can Google Trackside Butcher Shop. They have a website. They have more information on, on their cuts and their charges and things like that. And it's my understanding that in the near future, they're going to offer retail meat at their facility as well. Currently, they have retail sausage. He bought some frozen sausage just a little while ago when we were there. Now, what kind of sausage is it? Is it beef and pork, chicken and pork? It's all pork. Okay. You're going to have to fix that. They're plate. not going to do any chickens, is my understanding. Uh, that requires on, separate equipment. Mm. Equipment that's used for beef can't be used for chicken and vice versa. So they're going to just not do chicken at this time. Now, now you can scoop. See? So do they have a website? Yeah. Trackside Butcher Shop. And the shop is like Old English, S-H-O-P-P-E. They also have Facebook. But the, the people that are doing it are some guys that I went to high school with. There's two guys I went to high school with and their wives, and that's their, their new enterprise. And what's their background in, are they, are they, oh, they ranchers? Grew, they grew up on farms here in the county, and... Uh, they both work for a for a company, and they're both wanting to get this business going to where they don't have to work for the man anymore. Yeah, we'll just pass on that one for now, and then uh, 